So uh, I'm here to set the tone for uh, the panel session, which is going to discuss startups and uh, the startup bill. Uh, I've been told I have 10 minutes, so I'm going to use this uh, very wisely. Um, as we know, innovation precedes regulation. The question always is, you know, how do we bridge the gap between innovation and regulation? This is why we're here today, to understand the relationship, the interrelationship between what the policymakers do and what the practitioners who actually create these great ideas and values, um, how we can bridge the gap. Uh, so growth often comes with inconveniences, as we know. Um, you generally refer to it as disruption. Uh, we're going to talk about what disruption means and also what displacement means, which, which is what government sees a lot of times when disruption happens. Uh, you have to think about the stages of any transformation, like the butterfly uh, or like children, if you have kids. This is uh, work changing this thing. OK. So in the notes for this event, I was asked to talk about the United States. And you know, I always have an issue comparing us to America. And I know everybody does the cardinal sin, sin, sin of comparing us to India. But once again, I've come and I've come with uh, India comparison. Um, one of the key things that you know, caught my attention was that we, we've been celebrating the number of um, unicorns in Nigeria. I think right now we're five or six. And recently, I saw data that showed that India has done about 38 you know, in 2021 alone. So when tech startups began gaining prominence in Nigeria and Africa, many people did not understand what was happening or where we were going. Many stakeholders weren't sure how to react. You know, and this is especially, I guess, those of us in government. You know, we're still learning how to look at the disruption which startups bring into, into, the, into the economy. Um, there's a startup offering solution for almost every problem right now, at uh, different stages of growth, right? Some of them are unicorns, and some of them are still in their village trying to figure it out. I've moved away from saying garage because we don't have garages in Nigeria. So uh, units location is, is a village. So startups in a village. And, you know, and a number of them are on their way to becoming unicorns soon. So, like I said, you know, India, we're what? Maybe 20% of India's population. Uh, but a lot of similarities in our, in our population, how we're organized, and just generally how, you know, we, we handle things. Uh, we're about 20% of, of India. Um, I've, I've been known to tell people that we must, you know, careful who we compare ourselves to. So, for instance, you know, like I said, we don't have garages, you know, so ideas are developed in, in the village. And that, vi that, that mission statement, there's a mission statement there where if you think about, if we say that we want startups to start in our villages, using that as a mission statement, there's a number of things that has to be in place for that to come to fruition. Things like infrastructure in place, things like access, things like education that has to be in place for people in our village to be able to come up with great ideas. So there are a number of stats on, 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 on this slide, you know, the number of jobs that are being created, the value of the Indian startup is basically the same as South Africa, Nigeria, India, and, uh, Kenya, and Ghana combined. Um, and they have about 73 unicorns in, in India. Technology fail? Ah, there we go. So, as we know, Nigeria is a huge market, right? So there's the idea of the supply and the demand, right? Oh, whoa. How do you take this thing backwards? Wrong side. There we go. There's the idea of the supply and the demand, right? Um, the pandemic has created, has fast-forwarded technology, has pushed us to a point where we're a bit more dependent on technology. Interestingly enough, I've uh, been in a number of teams doing a number of projects where I had never met the people, right? We all met on Zoom. Today alone, the, the, one of the guys from SEC was here. I met him for the first time. Adora, who just spoke, we've had several meetings. Today was the first time I met her. In fact, two of them, today's the first day I'm meeting you in person. And even members of Nigerian Startup Bill, I met two of them today for the very first time. So the way we work has definitely changed. And what is critical is that we understand that, understand what the, the impacts of the pandemic and also the, the, the impact of the, the, the change in our, in, our, in our ecosystem. I was asked a very key question today and, and somewhat touchy. 
you know, it was by some young students. I had an early engagement. And the question was, when do we get Twitter back? And my response, which they weren't happy about, was, where's the Nigerian Twitter? Right? So I think there's a, there's a, there's a misunderstanding or not fully appreciating our own markets. You know, most people have thought that, well, including me, because I didn't do it, so I'm not blaming anybody, um, that when something is removed, but the market still exists and it needs to exist, is a perfect opportunity to have invented, not invented, created, you know, a local version. So we have a demand and we have supply, right? Supply being we have talent. We have very talented people. We have a very energetic youth. Demand is that we have the market. We have the same effects as, as any market has been affected by the pandemic. We have the same effect as people are beginning to rely on technology more. So that's happening in both markets. So we can easily be there as well. So Nigeria has a very creative, intelligent, energetic young people. It's a massive, this is a massive African advantage. I think a lot of times we throw the number out that about 60% are under 25 or under 30. You know, that's a huge opportunity that we have to capitalize on. You know, it's critical that we understand that, you know, we need to start positioning ourselves as a country to make employers instead of employees. We need to make creators instead of consumers. This is something I say to my son every time he plays a video game. I'm trying to understand how can I get him to invent a video game. But when we look at our youth, we have to understand how can we enable our youth, our youth how can we create that enabling environment that they ultimately can become creators instead of consumers. Okay, so that I don't get uh, flogged by the organizers, I was my notes. I was I was I was said to speak to speak about American and the various policies that they they have there. Um, you know, when you look at America, we see a number of policies that act and let support that supports that we see in American digital economy. It's not one. It's not two. It's, it's, it's a number of things that created the single. You know, the Silicon Valley and the um, the Silicon Alley in New York, uh, and every other American city has their own version. Austin, everybody's coming up with their own their own uh, version of rules. You know, entrepreneurship has now become uh, a major in university. In fact, my, my oldest son is studying entrepreneurship in university. It's now something people go to study because they have gotten to a level of maturity that developing your own business idea is a, is a, is a, is a, is a study. Um, so, so an ecosystem must be built on a bed of laws to enable growth to fruition. These laws form a playing field or a common ground. And this is something we have to understand. I've been asked the question, I think I was told the question was asked earlier, why do we need a startup bill? Now, one of the key things we have to understand is that we don't have a playing field. For rules, to, for, for you to be able to create value and be able to engage with both sides of the ecosystem, both sides of the ecosystem being one side being the policymaker and the other side being the practitioner, you have to have rules. Playing the playing field, you have to be able to have a common ground, a common understanding, and that's what the, one of the things the bill brings into uh, into play. This thing doesn't like me, which is interesting. Most there we go. Okay, so why is there a need for the NSB in the first place? So that I'll say the major reason is the opportunity for both sides of the ecosystem, government and private sector to engage each other. All steps leading to the creation of the bill involve crucial conversations between ecosystem practitioners and government, which is the key problem that we're suffering today is a lack of engagement. These conversations enable both parties to understand each other and work together for our nation and its economy to grow, there is a need for collaboration between all sectors and the government, whereby decisions are made to benefit, benefit us all. So the NSB aims to ensure better regulatory certainty, you know, so that laws and policies that affect startups provide much clarity and are scheduled and timed. I think that's one of the issues. One of the key things my team always says is, you know, friendly regulation. And I tell them, regulations don't need to be friendly. What they need to be is planned. What it needs to be is you need to understand what it means and you're able to plan against it. Sure, friendly regulations would be good as well. 
Another major reason for the NSB is to create a enabling environment for startups, an environment that values innovation and encourages initiatives needed for growth of the economy as a whole. Ultimately, the strength of a nation is the people. And one of the key things Nigeria has is a lot of young people. This is why NSB aims to develop its people in tech space and encourage innovation. So I think I'm, I'm running out of time, but it was critical that I um, just highlight some of the areas of the bill. So the bill has a number of areas. Um, one of them is a council, which we're setting up. Now the council, hold on a second. Time's up. <laughs> I don't have any time. So let me just do this quickly. So the bill has the idea of a council. And the council is going to provide oversight on the startup ecosystem. The council is balanced between very senior government officials and private sector players. Funders, early stage startups, startups, and a number of them. It's a balanced council. There's the idea of a portal. The portal is a place where you can actually have exchange. You have labor startups that come into this portal and all the... Um, activities ranging from things like patents, uh, CAC, all the government agencies they want to engage will be sitting in this portal. Um, things like credit schemes, a fund, will all be accessed through this portal. Talent development, incentives, there's such things as tax incentives uh, for people who work for startups, tax incentives for angel investors, tax incentives for local investors because we want to encourage local investors. And lastly, because I'm sort of rushing, I apologize, um, is as a seed fund that's been set up that will be managed by the NSIA to help um, get startups going. Because one of the key things is that we want startups to uh, not want just be encouraged, but be financed locally uh, before we start looking for um, global investors. So I will stop there. Basically, what I, on this slide is just basically some stats. Uh, we've had a lot of engagement um, and it's still ongoing. Um, ranging from a lot of volunteers. The youths are very excited. We have over 300 volunteers that have volunteered on the project, doing a, a range of things. We've had several town halls around the country, focus groups, with, uh, different focus groups, for people to review the bill and give feedback. And the current status now is the bill is pending um, review and approval by the Federal Executive Council. And this is how you, you reach us, follow us, support us, uh, give feedback, share, Thank you very much. Thank you so much. We'll also like uh, each and every one of us to please, let's do this, let's put our hands together one more time, ladies and gentlemen. All right. So it's now time for us to move on to the second plenary discussion. You just heard from the lead discussant. And to do this, I'd like to introduce all the panelists. Please just watch the video. All right, let's put our hands together one more time. We have seen them all. Now it's time for us to invite them on stage. So please, we'd like each and every of our discussants to please come on stage. We'd like to invite Executive Director, Sahel Capital Partners, Olumide Lawson, please kindly join us on stage, please. We'd also like to invite uh, Shalakwe Hammond, Special Advisor on SDGs and Investments, Lagos State. Thank you so much. Please, let's put our hands together, ladies and gentlemen, please. We'd also like to invite founder and CEO Tro Finance, Olua Tomi Jolanke, please kindly join us on stage as well. Co-founder and CMO Piggy Vest, Joshua Chibweze, please join us on stage as well. And not forgetting to uh, Olumide Shiyombo, please. That's co-founder, Blue Chip Technologies Limited and Voltron Capital. He also joins us here, please. And we have our very own moderator who will be here as well. 
I'm talking about also co-founder Budget, Joseph uh, Agubaide. Please also join us here. The one. Okay. okay. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Are we having a great time? Okay, great. Um, so let me jump in quickly. Um, thank you so much, um, Mr. Gobadia. I hope I didn't know that the name. <laughs> all right. Um, so on the panel, um, you've heard all of their names. So I'll just start with you. Um, thank you so much for that insightful um, you know, session. And so the question um, I would like to put to you first is, um, what will be the, next, the extent of involvement of government in the startup ecosystem? in line with this um, startup deal. You can just. So I'm having a bad mic day. <laughs> so, um, so the idea is more so in engagement, right? It's engagement and collaboration. Um, one of the key things, and I think I've said it for the second time today, is that a lot of times when people are developing their idea, um, they aim to disrupt the market. And what, what we find or what I've come to recognize is that there's not too much concern on what the displacement is, right? So when you disrupt the market, there's a displacement. Something gets displaced. You know, you do taxi hailing. Then on the other hand, taxi driver is going to have an issue. So it's really about having a conversation with government, right? So a lot of these ideas are somewhat lack of a better description, um, are being done in the dark, right? So you're doing this idea, and it's causing disruption in the real market. And what would need to happen is an understanding of what the idea is, and be able to graph out when you're going to be able to create value for that displacement that you caused. So that takes a conversation, and that conversation is not happening. So what you tend to find is, somebody is doing a fantastic idea, next thing the regulator does something, there's an issue. But there's a, there would have been a conversation that would have prevented that. Well, thank you for um, that um, insightful. Um, so to answer your question, basically you asked me, what is the level of engagement? Yeah, right? absolutely. It's really about ensuring that both sides, right? So even before I started this Nigerian Startup Bill initiative, um, I never really thought of the ecosystem beyond, you know, the guys I know who are creating fantastic ideas, right? So the understanding that the ecosystem actually has two parts, government, and policymakers and practitioners, and the continued collaboration and the continued conversation, right? It becomes a, a relationship and that's a true ecosystem in the biological sense. That's what's required. So it's not really from a sense of what is government's participation, it's really from a sense of what is both parties' engagement, what level of engagement they, they, they're gonna have. I think I'd like to ask one more question, uh, ask you one more question before I, I move, to, uh, move on on this. Um, you know, the worry the citizens have is the, um, you know, this is, you're going to be legislating startup, <laughs> you know. Um, so to what extent do you think that, um, you know, government can actually, um, when they come in, you know, so, because right now we feel that, um, you know, maybe just a little thing that we want from government. Now it's going to become a law. It's going to become, you know, enforcement and all of that. So can you speak to that, um, you know, to what extent can this um, legislative work, you know, impact um, the startup as it is? Will it, will it also disrupt, because we talked about the fact that disruption leads to displacement on your own side. Now you are going to legislate this thing. Um, to what extent um, is that going to affect what we have today? So I, I understand the fear and I've, I've, I've heard that right from the beginning, we've heard this particular fear. Um, I would say that the, the legislature is, is, is primarily to, to create the conversation, is, is primarily to 
create a mode of engagement. So I think towards the end of my slide, I didn't get a chance to break down all the different things that are happening. You know, there's a lot of uh, enabling initiatives or enabling um, uh, laws in the bill. Um, but one of the key parts that I'm really excited about is the idea of recourse, right? So today you don't really have recourse. So in the bill, you have the ability to say, here's an issue, let's table it, and let's discuss from both parties what this issue is, what is disruption, fantastic. So you're saying if we do this over five years, we'll get 50X in the economy, right? And we're just displacing something that's given us 2X. That conversation is not happening. So the 2X, because it's known to the regulator, may make us toss the 10X out the window because there's no platform for conversation. There's no platform for engagement. So right off the top of the bill is the idea of the council. And that council is a place where even the work happens, the council, but the work happens behind. There's a secretariat and a number of other things that are in the bill that shows that is an, the idea is that you continue to have a conversation. Even the portal has the idea of consultative parties, as in anybody who has a startup can be part of that consultative party to start discussing what the issue is and what the potential of what they're working on so that that disruption displacement is understood and managed out. So right now, all you're feeling is disruption and all the policy see, uh, maker is seeing is displacement. And if you don't educate them and they don't want to be educated, you're gonna have the current state of affairs over and over and over again. And it's always fire on the mountain. So it's not, it's not I know, the, the original fear of the bill is that you're coming to re regulate uh, startups, you're coming to you know, innovation that shouldn't be held. It's not so much trying to hold innovation, it's really trying to create an enabling environment for it. So I'll give you an example. Um, this one, I, I ran into a podcast recently. Um, this was about the company RIM, RIM Technology. Um, somewhere in 2001, they were sued for uh, infringement, patent infringement. Now, five years later, they get paid $600 million just for patent infringement. Now, those kind of things don't happen if you don't have a playing field. Right? If you don't have that playing field, then there's no, there's no rules of engagement where you say, okay, this rule, we actually can follow up on this particular rule, this is a patent rule, and something upholds it. So that's, if you think about it, that's another level of startups because the company owned the, the, the patent wasn't doing anything with it. They, they weren't trying to do the new BlackBerry. They just had the patent. And it later turns out that the patent wasn't even truly valid, that they got $600 million for nothing, right? Because RIM paid it irrevocably. So we're talking about creating the enabling environment for you to have ideas that you don't even execute, but you've packed it, and for you to actually have ideas you build out. So it's not so much that the, 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 the law is a regulation. It's not. It's how do we co-create regulations is what the law is doing. What is the process in which future regulations will happen? So lastly, for instance, all new regulations as per the bill will go through the bill. So the, the new regulations has to go through the, 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 the consultative, consultative body. So somebody in some MDA cannot just come up with a new regulation and be off with it. It has to actually go through this process. That's one thing, and sorry, I said last, let me just add this. The other thing we're also doing is that one of the things we realized through the process is that a lot of things, and, and we already started this conversation, <laughs> a lot of things that we find that um, affect uh, startups are not always national. A lot of times they're also subnational. So the conversation with states has also become very important to engage states to try to domesticate the Nigerian startup bill in their states so that we now have you know, bills that are you know, from a national level, a bills from a subnational level that are, that are domesticated with the state strategy. Um, but the general idea is that you now have a, a, a complete fabric of laws that guides your startup. Then you now, need, as, a, as a founder, will now decide which state you wanna, you wanna build your startup. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, some of the key points you mentioned, uh, we talk about disruption leading to displacement, talk about clarity on regulation um, in each industry. Um, you also talk about the fact that, uh, you know, justice is something that is important for growth. Um, you know, you can easily sue and get sued. Today in Nigeria, I think that is a big deal. Um, you talk about co-creation between startup and regulators, um, and then of course um, subnational bylaws. You know to align with subnational bylaws. That's um, very helpful. Uh, my next question will be to Olumide Lawson, the executive director of Sahel Capital, 
Um, the investment landscape in Africa is fraught with challenges and risk for investors. Um, with currency risk as one weighty challenge of investing in Africa, um, as well as political risk. This risk further exacerbates um, the problem that startups on the continent face with regard to assessing capital. Investors become greatly reluctant to participate in the investment climate in Africa because of these concerns and fears. However, in spite of this apprehension, we know that private equity is a significant catalyst for growth in Africa with over $24.4 billion in investment deals in Africa recorded across 953 um, private equity deals between 2012 and 2017. So this is a question. What expectations do you have as an investor for the startup bill to help to mitigate the risk and challenges that investors face when trying to invest in African ventures? Hello. Yes. Hello. Can you hear me? So good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you very much. Um, I think one, one duty of risk is also return. You know, so I think with the, with the, with the um, opportunities that are exactly risk has now even created more opportunities for return in, so, in, in startups. I read somewhere recently that um, in Nigeria, I think in the last 12 months, there's been almost 1.5 billion investment in startups. You know, and um, I think what I would like to point out that some of those things that we've seen as investors in this space that I think would help if the, the bill can actually address to even help to even improve the opportunities in this space. Um, the first one I would mention is the challenge with repatriation of funds. Um, the fund I manage, um, as I'm not sure I mentioned earlier, it actually is a, is a private equity fund that invests in agriculture in Nigeria, but the funds are from foreign investors. Now, one of the biggest issues we've had is that we've made the investments, we've made some Naira return, but how do we repatriate the funds back to the investors? You know, at, at the beginning, we we get a, a capi, the, the certificate of capital importation, you know, but at the point of repatriation, one is it's difficult for one to actually be able to get the money out of the country at the official rate, which was the rate which we, at the time the money was brought in. So for me, that is one of the biggest challenges. You know, so I think of um, any, of, any um, solution where the, the, um, some of the investments in startups can actually be channeled towards helping um, foreign investors to actually take out those funds at the same rate or related rate as when money was brought in, I think will be helpful. Um, Links to this, I think one big challenge I see again is um, the challenge with, of course, FX risk. It's one thing to invest in one at 300 or 200 naira per dollar, and then three or four years down the line, you know, um, some of those, the, the dollar is now 600. So um, for us, that is one risk we've seen. While the um, investments we've done, one tries to mitigate against this risk, but I think it's almost looking impossible for one to actually be able to address that. Um, another issue that we've seen that I think has, uh, that could be managed, really, I, I think, it relates to any startup, which is the risk of business in Nigeria in general. And what we've seen is that while we uh, private equity investors like to uh, um, develop um, smallholders, SMEs, you know, you also, particularly your concern about the risk. You mentioned about um, security risk and a couple others, you know. We've seen where NERSAL has tried to help with um, providing some, some, of, some sort of insurance guarantees, you know, but I think opportunities are along those lines to help to safeguard um, investor funds, you know, will also be definitely be very um, helpful as well. The last area that I think will be helpful and we, which we have seen a little bit of is um, the area of technical assistance facilities. You know, where the government or, or donors help to help these SMEs or small or smallholders or startups by providing some level of technical assistance facilities to help to improve even the opportunities in those spaces. I think some of this will help to even improve the, the outlook to agriculture to, to um, stand up uh, startup companies in general. Thank you. Thank you so much for that um, clear answer. And my next question is to um, Sholakpi Hammond. <laughs> it is expected that through the technological advancement that Africa is experiencing, <laughs> there will be significant progress towards sustainable development goals. However, in the light of this growth, it is important that startups are ensuring that their initiative meet up with environmental, social, governance uh, needs so as to ensure that they are not harming the environment and are innovating sustainably. Regulation within the startup space is to ensure that this is 
and this overarching goal and objective of innovating in the right manner is enforced and that initiatives that harm the planet are discouraged. So in what manner, the question, in what manner should the startup bill capture the necessity for startups to embrace the spirit of the sustainable development goals? Okay, well, thank you, Joseph. So first of all, I have to say that I think everybody should embrace the SDGs. So that's just my own personal bias. Um, but I think that's a great question. And it, it sort of aligns to some of the things that also had said earlier on around um, even just the way that the bill itself should work. As you said, we're having conversations and some of the things that we think is it's important that central coordination um, does not become a limitation. Um, and that's why we have to commend the work that his office is doing, making sure that this is socialized. So first of all, the ecosystem must own this bill. Okay, it must not be driven by government. It can be supported by government, but at the end of the day, they must own this bill. We also believe that, as he has said, the states and indeed the local governments must, at the end of the day, be where the implementation is happening. And how does that tie to the question that you've asked? It's very difficult to solve a problem from a helicopter view. You're looking down. You're going to see, and I think that's why you see a lot of Me Too, um, a lot of Me Too applications. Um, people do things that they've seen done in other places. You may not really be applying local knowledge to solving a key problem. And that's really how we're going to address the SDGs. It's not, again, by copying what is happening anywhere else. It's by developing local solutions. And I, I think if we are able to make this a more local um, bill and put in place incentives for providing, those, for providing the solutions that we need home, from a homegrown perspective, we will get there. What does that then mean? What it means is the incentives there should, first of all, speak to people actually solving real problems. Okay, so um, there's some nice to have cosmetic, nice sounding things, but we must look at what our fundamental problems are. And I'm very excited to see there's a great, obviously we've seen our payment space doing incredibly well. And that's because it's a very, I actually think it's succeeding because it's a very well regulated space. Um, the financial sector in Nigeria is very well regulated. And so people are able to pick things and address specific problems and there's enough guidance within the regulations to be able to help we need to see that in agri we've seen some in agri seen some in health seeing some in environmental in the environmental space but we need to see that at every level we've seen that, that in education um, and a lot of those things align with the SDGs. so we can take the SDGs, for example as a, as a framework and look to create local solutions look to align the incentives that we're creating to make sure that we're able to support them so you're Incentivized companies, for example, and I think those are some of the things that are already in the bill, incentivize companies, give them tax breaks if they're supporting startups that are doing things in specific sectors. Incentivize them if they are um, innovating in a particular industry. Incentivize them if they're building talent in, a, in an area of interest. But it's very difficult, again, to do that from a national perspective because, you, and I think even the, the, the um, presentation by... Um, um, Flutter Wave kind of spoke to that a little bit. Africa is in one country. Well, Nigeria itself is one country, but it's a highly heterogeneous country. So it's very difficult to have a unique approach that is Nigeria. Even if you're trying to solve the housing challenge, the challenge of a state like Lagos, that is very small, um, you know, has a very limited um, firm land and has a huge population density, the solution for homes is not the same as in Niger state where they've got a lot of land and fewer people. But if you try and legislate from a national level, then it becomes difficult. So we need to encourage local solutions. And I think the way to do that is to encourage that these, um, whatever is contained in the bill comes from the states and even from the local governments. It has to be socialized from a local level. And I think we also have to ensure that the entire ecosystem is carried along. I think Oswald's doing a fantastic job. They're talking to schools, they're talking to the ecosystem. We all have to own this and make sure that what is inside fully represents all of us and not just some of us. Thank you so much. That's very powerful. Um, I really um, learned a lot from that. Um, you actually answered my second question. <laughs> Sort of, you know, but I just want to say something to that um, effect. In AOT 1.0, one of the parts that I really loved was the design thinking session. And, you know, we need to bring that in back to every AOT, <laughs> my recommendation. <laughs> you know, and, um, you know, speaking to what you said about, um, you know, regulation being a guide, you know, such that in the specific verticals, and when there are regulation, you know what you can build and what not to build. Instead of just building a blanket app that at the end of the day, 
um, never make sense. And that is why I think some startups never get to raise money, yeah. um, you know, at the end of the day. Um, you also talk about, um, you know, sort of incentivizing the startups. I think um, they, they both work together. Um, the last couple of, um, you know, last two years, I've been working seriously as a design coach. And I've seen how impactful it can be when people work within a guided um, framework. You know, when you are able to identify the specific problem, um, you know, in the, in the local environment where people are, and people come together, they think through the problem, and they're able to understand it very well. Then people can come up with better solutions. Um, you know, so I think um, it was the Microsoft country director that talked about having a sandbox, yeah. startup sandbox within this framework. Um, I, I think that's going to be very, very powerful, um, you know, to, to help us achieve our goal. If I can, um, just, if I can just add okay, to yeah. that, I think it's also very critical. And I think just in respect, I think for me, when someone asked the question that Tuboson answered, the essay answered earlier on around this, and speaking to even what Oswald has said about uh, disenfranchisement of certain sectors. We also have to remember that the startup ecosystem, yes, it's all it's a lot of bells and whistles. There's a lot of technology involved, and you're afraid that the real sector, in a way, will be disconnected. But it not very often is not. So you look at com companies like Amazon. So Amazon is a collection of traders and manufacturers who are now able to access a global market where, which they couldn't before. Even Instagram has done that for us in Nigeria. I, you know, I went to some event in Italy, and I had this. Um, Nigerian friend of mine rock up in a Nigerian outfit and I'm like how did you get that oh some lady in Port Harcourt on Instagram got it and sent it to her in New York and she brought it to Italy we are galvanizing businesses far beyond their initial reach just by having access to technology so what we want to see is people in the automotive space picking up our vulcanizers people working on technology uh, you know building laptops and and, and and I've seen that happen actually engaging our people in computer village who are fixing things that's the way we're going to make sure people are not disenfranchised and we can also learn from them because they have a lot of things that they understand for example about how materials work in this part where they may not have been a lot of research so again we all have to come together pull together to make this work wow thank you thank you so much Olaki. um you know, very, very, very interesting. You talked about platforms, um, platforms, countries where we see um, that startups are doing very well, technology is doing very well, is building up platforms. And you can see how powerful that can be. And that will lead me to the next question, which we're going to my boss, um, Olumide Shoyombo. Um, you know, so there's keen interest of stakeholders across Africa business regions on the ways through which Africa's growth so far can be consolidated. The startup bill seems to offer a good deal of hope as to how to reduce calamities that come with harsh regulation and the instability of African markets, of the African market. The case of Silicon Valley and how the US government was able to stimulate the growth of the tech renaissance can serve as a vivid example of how growth can be nurtured. So my question to you will be, sir, what lesson does the Silicon Valley model of startup legislation offer for Africa? Thank you. Um, so, I mean, I've seen the draft of the startup bill that's been, and like Shalakri mentioned, the ecosystem has to own it, right? And it starts with us, with us moving. So you find out that the ecosystem starts moving, and then we stop by the bus stop and say, hey, government, jump in, though. this is where we are going. But then, if it's not a cooperative, if it's not a cooperative passenger, it can take the steering off you and, and, derail, and derail that journey. Um, I think if you look at the Silicon Valley model, it starts out with education and venture, right? And then education and venture then sitting down with the regulators and government to say, this is what we are doing, how can you governize it? And you find out that once it starts in one, in one jurisdiction, you find out that it creates um, competitiveness even amongst government regulators, right? You can see what's happening in Miami now, trying to drag drag all the action from Silicon Valley to Miami. Good competition around who is more, who is more willing to accept, to accept people into, into the space. Um, speaking as an investor, both as an angel and now running a fund, part of the things that the startup bill tries to encourage. So even before we had the startup bill, people were already investing, right? They were already backing interesting companies. And then how do you further incentivize that kind of behavior? Part of it lies with governments, obviously, but part of it also lies with the ecosystem itself. Um, when, when I'm investing in the company, the first thing I'm, I'm, I'm not first thinking about what tax credits am I going to get. I'm thinking about, okay, is this investment going to 
with what's my risk appetite for this investment? Is this investment protected? And to some, to some level of, to, to some extent, and will I make any return, right? And if I don't make any return, let it not be because the government did something um, that, that happened to, to that company. But then when you're now further incentivized with things around, I think the startup bill, or the draft startup bill speaks to some things around income tax, um, capital gains tax for, for investors. It gets people very, very interested. Um, but then people are already, we are seeing a huge appetite now. And I tell founders today that it's a founders, it's a founders market. Mm -hmm. Because now, with what's happening in the ecosystem, after the pay stack exit, flutter away one billion dollar valuation, you are hearing people say, "Hey, well, me, the next time you're investing, carry me, yes. carry me along. Go, <laughs> I will have my own twenty thousand. I have my own ten thousand dollars." They're not even thinking about tax credits that that could possibly become available when the startup bill um, comes in place. But imagine when you start talking about adding those um, things as icing on the cake. It governizes um, activity, and obviously that money stays back in the ecosystem when they are returned because the returns would eventually come. Um, and goes back into funding more companies. And that's how ecosystems develop. Thank you. All right. Um, I, the second question, you have sort of answered it, but I, I'd like you to really like emphasize that a little bit more um, on how best can Africa model, Africa model its own startup bill to cater to Africa's peculiar needs. Um, okay. I'm not a peculiar, and needs, and we say they are peculiar. Um, <laughs> Because it starts with what talent, right? Yeah. Every ecosystem starts with talent. If we are no people, there's nothing we are building. Um, so the startup bill, obviously, and I think there's there's a there's a huge focus on the draft on the draft startup bill around cooperation with with um, institutions, with tertiary institutions, right? Um, and interestingly, if you look at other markets, they form the backbone of of innovation, right? You see the Stanford go to Stanford and you see what they are doing with the Valley and so on. But that's missing in our, in, our, in our ecosystem, right? And because obviously everybody's doing things in silos, right? So if the startup, the startup bill helps or should help us in fostering those kind of engagements, right? Within, um, with the council, bringing in everybody together from tertiary, from the industry, and, that's, and then that goes into um, developing talent. So what are we... What does our curriculum even look like, right, in, in tertiary institutions? What, what are they teaching them about entrepreneurship? What are they teaching them about innovation and research, right? And those are the same people that, <clears throat> there was a reason why the whole, on paper anyway, while the whole ecosystem here, sort of in Lagos anyway, started, started out from Yaba. Everybody felt, okay, let's be in Yaba because we are close to tertiary institutions. And it did work to some extent. Um, but then what has happened back into those tertiary institutions? What has gone back to make sure that more of this kind of things can happen? So I think once we are able to bridge that gap between industry and classroom, um, we can then start building this pure talent that investors like us can then back. Wow, thank you so much. Um, I'm, I'm in Yaba and <laughs> I can testify I to this. Yaba. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm excited that today, last week gave grant to some university lecturers who are doing some R&D work. Um, nice. Kudos to you. Um, you know, uh, I've also been invited by the VC of Lagos um, once to, to talk to the school, to the students. It's, it's quite exciting, um, you know. So thank you for that um, great contribution. Um, so Oluwa Tomi Sholanke, the CEO of Trove, this question is for you. Um, investment in startups in Africa has, has more than doubled this year, um, yet a number of startups are still missing out of these funding opportunities. As much as such within the startup ecosystem, there's a number of allied startups that are capturing the bulk <laughs> of this funding. Why many early stage startups, in spite of how novel and scalable their ideas are, are unable to attract funds um, or scale? Why many have touted um, that the startup bill is the panacea to all these challenges through the democratization of access to capital for startups? There may, there may still be other avenues through which startups can be better offered value. So your question is, what other ways can Africa's startup ecosystem be positioned for growth and other, other than through the startup bill? What are other ways? Um, okay. So I don't know that there's uh, one silver bullet or there's, you know, 
any specific thing. Um, but if I were to look at it from my perspective, I would say it's a chicken and egg, you know, type of thing. So primary question for me is, you know, what makes for a thriving ecosystem? Um, and I think of it as four things. So one is talent, two is great ideas, um, three is um, capital, and four will be customers. So to position the ecosystem, I think all of these four things, you know, need to be actively built on or built, built upon or worked on. Um, Nigeria is the hotbed of talent. Um, you know, in terms of ideas, people have ideas. Um, I think the key missing pieces would be one capital, which is, you know, beginning to become, you know, a little more um, available. But four is, you know, customers. And, you know, to solve two of these things is, you know, more macro than anything else. Um, and so things, events like this, you know, that are, you know, a, you know, private, you know, public sector type of, you know, engagement or platform through which, you know, you can interface with government. You know, I think those type of things are key. Um, so the bill in itself is very interesting. I think it provides an avenue for people to start companies, for people to scale companies. But then when you start a company, key thing is, you know, customers, disposable income, you know, all of these things. Um, and so I think, you know, more active participation in, you know, government, um, social, in, social in issues um, and things of that sort, I think um, would properly catalyze um, the ecosystem. I think um, when, you know, more of the macro issues or when people that are, you know, champions of the ecosystem continue to scream or continue to, you know, lend their voices to, you know, bigger issues. I think the ecosystem or the country as a whole can move forward and uh, you would see people, you know, more comfortable or, com you know, comfortably thinking about infusing capital into the country. Um, we've had a lot of things today about repatriation of, you know, funds, um, a lot of things about, uh, or issues about, uh, you know, infrastructure is a very popular thing, thing today. So I think like once, you know, more of those macro issues, once we continue to lend our voices towards um, solving a lot of these macro issues, I think it will trickle down to, you know, things like pushing the ecosystem as a whole. And I don't think it's a, you know, one day process. Um, you know, Silicon Valley that we scream about today and we, we've come to appreciate and love um, has been something that has existed for, you know, for 50 plus years. Um, people have been championing and pushing the, um, the valley since you know the 70s um, and so you know it's just lending our voices continuously you know engagements like this um, with government um, trying to solve for you know macro issues that would uh, put more money in the hands of you know the average Nigerian um, which would then trickle down to customers you know being able to utilize a lot of these uh, services or platforms that exist and you know through all of that you can build a you know bolstering um, ecosystem, um, bigger products, um, and products that can really achieve scale um, the way we would like to think about it. Well, thank you so much um, for that insightful contribution. Um, I actually want to ask you one more question around, um, there are a lot of people here who are building startups. And, you know, like I described what I was, um, before I asked you the question that some people feel that certain startups are elites, you know, they're able to assess funding and all of that. Uh, but they, they've built maybe 10 startups and nothing has ever happened. They've never raised, you know, 10 naira, you know. Um, as someone who, who's, who's got experience in that, um, you know, um, aspect, what, what would you say to such a young, early-stage startup that, that is struggling to raise funding? Do you want to speak to that? Um, I, I, I think I would like to throw that question to you. Okay, both of you. Okay, let's let um, Olumide speak to it. Me? Yes, please. Oh, okay. Um, so, interestingly... Both Tommy and Josh are companies have invested in. So <laughs> okay. Operators okay, on the, great. On the, on the panel are companies have invested in. But I didn't know them from anywhere, right? So there is this whole notion of it's clicky that you have to belong to. I see that discussion has been happening on Twitter that you have to belong to a click. And it's, it's not that, right? It's about value. Um, I saw what Tommy was building, I saw what Josh and the team were building. And um, but I'd, I'd seen what risk they are taking on themselves before they even put themselves forward for investments, right? So you can't be in, a, in, in paid employment in a bank and say, hey, I want to build something. I have not left 
and taking a risk on yourself. And you're saying that you come and back the company. That when it starts making money, you leave, you leave and start and come and and come and focus on the company full time. So it's about values, right? So you must take a risk on yourself, you must be providing value. And um, today, I can I can say that the way where the ecosystem is today, there is nobody building an interesting company that's from a solid founder that would not be able to raise some pre-seed funding locally today. We have groups that we are raising $500,000, $250,000 in three, four days, right? Um, with, when you see serious operators um, who are taking risk on themselves and have something of value. So it starts with what value you have. And if, if, if that's on table, you'll find interesting people to back you. Wow, thank you. I mean, say, speaking to that, um, if I saw her, she raised 600000 in 24 hours or so. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, so... Um, no, that's part of the click, though. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I think I think that's a really great point. He, somebody's testifying, he's invested in at least two companies where he doesn't know the people. But how will they find you? It will not be in your room. So I, I constantly say this to the ecosystem and to, and to founders, if you want to start something or when you're ready to start something, please, please, please join a hub. Find your place. Let people know what you're doing. Don't just sit in your garage that we don't have, trying to innovate and then wondering why opportunities pass you by. When you're a member of the hubs, you hear about things. You, people run into you at those events. You understand what's going on. You hear other people have raised their funding. It's very important to be part of the ecosystem. So that's, that's I think that for me is the first. So be part of a hub, be part of an association. And if there's nothing in your space, start something. You know, start to gather your people around. That's where you find the talent. That, you may find the partner that has the skills that you don't have. Maybe you're really bad at financial management, but you're a great coder. You find your peer who's great at raising money. So sometimes you also have to recognize you may not have all the skills and you may not be able to afford people who have the skills, but you can you know, be generous, be ready to accept partners because ultimately what you're looking for is to scale and grow your business. So I think for me, that's very critical. The second thing is also to make a point. You know, it, it sounds very nice and I know people are really driven and some people are going to be, you know, the Mark Zuckerbergs of Nigeria who are not going to finish school and are going to start a business that, you know, as a teenager and it's going to be a multi-billion dollar business, but it's not meant for everyone. So the statistics say that I think you're 10 times more likely to succeed as a founder if you've had some experience in that industry. There's value to experience. So sometimes perhaps it's not to jump and, you know, just have this idea, you don't know how to grow a business, you won't know how to run it, you won't know how to hire people, you just have this really great idea. An idea is not a business, an idea is not a startup. So also, there's also value in gathering experience or buying the experience of other people who have done that, who have invested in working and even understanding how to work in teams, so that when you do start that business, if you do raise that money, there's less of a chance that that business will implode or ultimately fail. Thank you. Well, wow, thank you so much. What I even hear is that I mean, someone who, who's been seeing you somehow, probably on Twitter, um, somewhere, um, even though he doesn't know them, he somehow probably must have been hearing what they are doing somehow through his network. Um, you know, like tomorrow, there'll be a party, for example, a tech party that's been Yay. happening for years. So you have been groups. You know, some people don't even know about it and you're building tech startup. Eh? So please join the community and join the hub, attend tech uh, meetups, uh, meetups, you know. Those days, what we used to do, we just go to meetup.com, we go to Eventbrite. We look for tech events happening before COVID. I mean, those days. And I mean, I met Chicken Wobi 2010. <laughs> you know, you know, like at Back Camp and all of that. Um, you know, those are the places where it started from. And so please, when you hear something is happening in tech ecosystem, please try and participate. Don't just stay there. And, you know, you said something that is very important. Um, people like Mark Zuckerberg, there are exceptions. You know, a lot of times people want to be like Mark. You want to follow that playbook. You know, um, chances are that you are the rule and not the exception. So <laughs> always just judge yourself so that you will not be judged, you know. Um, so Chibu, Joshua Chibweze, um, co-founder of Pigvest, this question is to you. Um, with the volatile and fragmented nature of Africa's markets, startups have to constantly pivot and iterate their business models to match some of the pressing circumstances they face. Some of the challenges range from difficult taxation policies to harsh and cutthroat competitive strategies, to stringent government regulations. Startups are looking for havens for growth. 
where they can easily pivot and position themselves without the hassles and struggles to survive. As a startup founder with a platform that witnesses these challenges on a daily basis, the question, how would you best describe the benefits that startup legislation and the startup bill will bring to this ecosystem? Okay. Sorry. Uh... Hi, everyone. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, yes, to the question you asked. <laughs> Sorry about that. Yeah, so how would you best describe the benefits yeah. of startup legislation and the startup of will bring to the ecosystem? Okay. Um, so, I, for one, am particularly excited about the startup bill. Um, I think it's a very good next step for the ecosystem where it is right now. Um, when we started, we've, we started out five years ago, and I remember us having to apply to Leadbot. That was Mr. Olumide's um, accelerator at the time. There was no information. There, there wasn't a lot of information, a lot of things out there. But we applied and then we went on this journey pretty much on our own um, without having clarity on a lot of things. Um, I believe that the startup bill and this everything happening right now would, one, help the people who are building have a seat at the table with people who are making the laws. Um, so it kind of like creates a very seamless um, communication, right? So a lot of people who are people who are making these laws and policies don't necessarily understand some of the things we're building and how we're going about it. So first things first, I feel like this actually helps, puts us you know, in the, on the same table with them to actually express what we're doing, how we're going about it and see how we can help each other. Um, I also think it helps protect the investment long-term Right, so Nigeria is a very volatile market. Um, any policy can come and shut down your business at any time. Um, if we are somehow invested in this startup bill, for instance, um, I feel like we'll have less and less of those issues. Um, and, and then ultimately, it just helps the entire ecosystem. So there's, it even helps a lot of companies think about scaling. So one of the biggest challenges you know, we face in my own sector is you know, trust, right? Uh, there's a lot of things that can happen to you at any time. Someone can just come put out a tweet and then you're scrambling, trying to do damage control and everything. But there's just a lot that, you know, can be better if we're hearing about some of these policies before they are being implemented. So I think it actually helps. Um, it helps with scale. It helps with, you know, investment protection. It helps give us a seat at the table to be able to have those conversations with the people who are having them. All right, thank you so much, um, Joshua. Um, so, yeah, I've got limited time, and um, I think that um, we should just give room for one question. Um, okay, so, <laughs> all right, my, my time is up. Okay, okay, I'll take one question. Um, no female. If you've asked a question before, I won't take your question. So that's a way of, um, okay. Is that a female? No, no female is asking a question. All right, I will give you a chance then. A female? Okay, please, let's give her um, the question. Female, please, I I'm really sorry. I, I know I can see a couple of hands, but I think we need um, to get actively, you know. <laughs> oh, okay, only Shalakwe. So next time, please, we'll need more females on the panel. <laughs> Hi, thank you very much for the session. My name is Oluwa Damnola Um, So my question is for a startup. Um, so I'm a founder. Um, for someone like me who is, let's say, new to um, the startup space, how would you advise like, when it comes to raising funding? Um, I'm looking into debt equity, but there are not so much opportunities in that um, area. So like when it comes to debt funding, 
Like, how do you go about that? Yeah. Um, did you get and, the question? And are there like sectors in the space that are focused on that? I didn't hear the sector. Did you, debt, did you say debt? Yeah, yeah, yeah. raising debt in raising place of, debt. instead of equity. So you'd rather raise debt than equity? Yes. Hmm. <laughs> yeah, Shalapa, you want to speak to that? Okay, so, um, so first of all, I think the first, the answer to your first question <laughs> yeah, you, is, you will speak as I to said, that then we'll, we'll leave the stage because time has been passed. I think the answer to the first question is join a hub. You know, get familiar with the information, understand what's on, going on in your me, sector. Like, um, okay. Um, it's interesting if you say debt, it's surprising that you would want to borrow because it's, it's very difficult to scale with just debt. Um, a lot of the things that you need to invest as a startup are things that may not necessarily pay off in, in the interim. So your test, your product market fit, you're going to have to do a lot of testing. Acquiring customers is expensive. Those are, and you don't know when the payoff is going to come. So it's very difficult to borrow money and then have an obligation that you have to service every month without knowing, and you're going to have to pay salaries, you're going to have to fund infrastructure, you're going to have to invest in the technology. It, it, it'll be very difficult to do that with money that has a certain repayment timeline, but you don't know when your money is coming in. So debt, that's why debt is usually not very advisable for a startup. Of course, we can listen to you. Maybe you have one secret source startup that Olumide and I can invest in. You know, me to have one small 10K. But um, debt for a startup is usually not the path. If it's an SME, which is a proven market, something that is already, you don't have to invest too much to understand how to do it. You want to start a laundry, you want to do, you know, certain things that are very clear. Then um, debt works because you know, okay, I start this, I already have 20 customers. They're going to start paying me. What they're paying me is more than the money of borrowing and I want to hold on to 100% equity. So you also have to think about your model. When is money going to start coming in? That determines the kind of money you need to take to fund what you need to put in place for that revenue to come in. But join a hub. They will provide you all these advisory services. Have you done a business model canvas? Have you done a pitch competition? Have you documented, you have a business plan for what you want to do? Do you have partners for everything? Do you have a roadmap for where you're going? Are you tracking your metrics for how money is going to come in? If the answer to all of those questions is no, join a hub. Well, thank you. Um, thank you. <laughs> all right. Okay, you want to say something? Okay. One in one minute. I think just add to um, a comment for you. There are very, very many sector-specific funders. You know, so um, depending on your sector, you may need to do your own homework to understand who are the typical funders you know, that invest in your own area. Some funders are commercially, look at the commercial, some look at the impact. You know, So it might be helpful in, in, as a link by either equity or debt, there's no room for both of them. But the important thing is that for many sectors, there are specific you have second of specific funders and you actually look at that might help you as well. Just not to add that as well. Okay, I'm afraid um, we might not be able to take more than that again this evening. Thank you so much for participating. Thank you um, so much, Josh, Trove CEO, um, Sahel Partner, Olumide Shoyombo, Shalakwe, and Mr. Gobadia. Thank you so much. Um, for those of us that want to know more about Startup Bill, check startupbill.ng, um, the website. You can follow them on Instagram. Start up Bill NG on Instagram. Um, I, I'm sure if you Google the rest, you will find it. Thank you so much for listening.